Hello and welcome to Games from Folk Tales, a podcast that mixes historical research and tabletop role-playing settings. I'm your host, Timothy Ferguson. This week, story hooks from medieval dowry bargaining. For this talk on dowries and bargaining, let's use the bard. The following passages are modernizations of Shakespeare from The Taming of the Shrew. To set the scene, Baptista is a medieval merchant who has no sons and two daughters, Kate and Bianca. Bianca has four suitors. Kate has none because she's a shrew. Bianca cannot marry until Kate does. Baptista and three of Bianca's suitors want to find Kate a husband. Petruchio is of a wealthy family and arrives in Padua looking for a rich marriage. He doesn't much care about what his wife is like, provided he gets a lot of money for her. Let's pause it here for a second, our players waiting on the stage, frozen, while we consider them to a degree not envisioned by Shakespeare. Baptista has no heir. Technically, in period, this is not correct. There are other ways for a merchant family to continue its business through the female line. But even then, the guy has a problem with regard to posterity. Neither daughter is married, so no grandchildren, so no heir. Oddly, he doesn't seem to have the sort of hanger-on nephews that people in his situation seemed to attract. He wants to get a daughter married off quickly, and he won't marry off the young one before the older one. The problem is Kate, the elder daughter, who, to quote the musical again, hates men. Actually, she hates having to be a wife to them because it's bloody ghastly. But in her explanation, you kind of wonder if she's laying it on a bit thick. She talks about the labour of cleaning up after them, and the first thing you ask is, do you plan to marry someone too poor to have servants? Obviously, she has no intention of it. To quote Diana Maturin, be damned to love in a cottage. She wants her own time, her own space, her own money, and until she marries, it's an embarrassment for her younger sister to marry. So there's the setup. Rich guy, daughters, suitors for the youngest. Petruchio talks to one of the suitors, and the suitor jests that he might marry Kate. Petruchio hears she's lovely and rich but shrewish, and says, and says, I've braved thunder and cannon fire. Why not, mate? The joking guy goes, Are you, like, serious, dude? And Petruchio is all like, Yes, dude, if the bag's full of gold, who cares if it's a bit old? And so the suitor introduces him to all the other suitors who shout him drinks, and the suitors agree to all be cool with each other and hang out. Rivals in love, but the best of mates. See, that's an adventuring party right there. It really is this teenagely boyish in the play, even though... One of the suitors is old enough to be Bianca's father. Now, why exactly Kate doesn't just step out of line and join an Italian nunnery is an interesting question that's not covered in the play at all. Some Italian nunneries were quite liberal, even by modern standards. Let's let that go. It seems to be that Baptista genuinely loves his daughters and wants them to be happy. This is less rare than some commentators seem to think. Now let's borrow some audio from a LibriVox public domain recording. The speakers are Petruchio, then Baptista. Signor Baptista, my business asketh haste, and every day I cannot come to woo. You knew my father well, and in him me, left solely heir to all his lands and goods, which I have bettered rather than decreased. Then tell me, if I get your daughter's love, what dowry shall I have with her to wife? After my death, the one half of my lands, and in possession twenty thousand crowns. And for that dowry I'll assure her of her widowhood, be it that she survive me, in all my lands and leases whatsoever. Let specialties be therefore drawn between us, that covenants may be kept on either hand. Ay, when the special thing is well obtained, that is, her love, for that is all in all. So that's the deal done. Let's look at how the sausage was made. Baptista offers half of his stuff once he's dead. Well, he has two daughters, so that's no big deal. He has offered not to give all of his stuff to Bianca and Bianca's kid if she has sons and Kate has daughters, but that's about it. As the spice for the deal, he also offers a whole heap of cash, 20,000 crowns. Now, how much is 20,000 crowns? A crown is five shillings. A crown is a quarter of a pound, so that's 5,000 pounds. Now, in Shakespeare's time, that's silver, not gold, but still... That's about 500 actual pounds of gold in money right there. So why is he willing to drop that down as his opening offer? Here, have a room full of gold. 
Well, the first reason is that he's very rich. Very, very, very rich. And he wants Petruchio to know that he's very, very rich. He wants everyone to know he's very, very rich. The social place of the middle classes in mythic Europe is constantly tested by their expenditure. It's not enough to be very rich. You must spend the money. A second point is that Baptista isn't making one deal, he's making two. He's looking at the Bianca deal. His problem isn't his youngest daughter. She's lovely, she's loved by many, she would love many if she could. Kate's dad knows time is not on his side because, among other things, his daughter may go boy crazy and get pregnant before things are formalised legally with a husband. Because it clears the way for the second deal. Cole Porter gives Bianca any Tom, Harry or Dick as her signature tune. And it's clever, but when in the final line she says repeatedly that she'll take any, well, any not Tom or Harry, you can see that he's doing that thing he does where he pushes the sex angle as hard as he thinks he can get away with. Baptista, however, is a bit of a softy. He says that Kate needs to consent. Now, legally, this is true, but what he actually means is that he won't threaten her until she consents. He doesn't offer to do this with Bianca. Quick quote from Petruchio again. And therefore, setting all this chat aside, thus in plain terms, your father hath consented that you shall be my wife, your dowry agreed on. And will you, nil you, I will marry you. Now, this is just wrong in canon law. Kate must give free consent. Practicalities oft intrude. Give me thy hand, Kate. I will unto Venice, to buy apparel against the wedding day, provide the feast, father, and bid the guests. I will be sure my Catherine shall be fine. Note that Baptista provides the wedding feast. So let's look at the second deal. Baptista gets two of the suitors, Grimio and Triano, who is pretending to be a nobleman called Lucentio, who was his foster brother. Sorry for the technicality, but it is Shakespeare. Someone's got to be pretending to be someone else. He then auctions Bianca's future on her behalf. And once again over to the LibriVox players. Content you, gentlemen, I'll compound this strife. Tis deeds must win the prize, and he of both that can assure my daughter greatest dower shall have my Bianca's love. Say, Signor Gremio, what can you assure her? First, as you know, my house within the city is richly furnished with plate and gold basins and ewers to lave her dainty hands, my hangings all of Tyrian tapestry. In ivory coffers I have stuffed my crowns, in cypress chests my arras counterpoints, costly apparel, tents and canopies, fine linens, turkey cushions bossed with pearl, valance of Venice gold and needlework, pewter and brass, and all things that belong to house or housekeeping. Then at my farm I have six hundred milk kind to the pale, six score fat oxen standing in my stalls, and all things answerable to this portion. Myself am stuck in years, I must confess, and if I die to-morrow, this is hers. If whilst I live, she will be only mine. That only came well in. Sir, list to me. I am my father's heir and only son. If I may have your daughter to my wife, I'll leave her houses three or four as good within rich Pisa's walls as any one old Signor Gremio has in Padua. Besides two thousand ducats by the year of fruitful land, all which shall be her jointure. What, have I pinched you, Signor Gremio? Two thousand ducats by year of land. My land amounts not to so much in all that she shall have, besides an argosy that now lies in Marseilles' road. What, have I choked you with an argosy? Gremio, tis known my father hath no less than three great argosies, besides two galleuses and twelve tight galleys. These I will assure her, and twice as much, whate'er thou offerest next. Nay, I have offered all, I have no— Pardon me. If you should die before him, where's her dower? That's but a cavil. He is old, I young. And may not young men die as well as old? Well, gentlemen, I am thus resolved— on Sunday next, you know, my daughter Catherine is to be married. Now, on the Sunday following, shall Bianca be bride to you, if you make this assurance, if not to Signor Gremio. And so I take my leave, and thank you both. Adieu, good neighbour. 
Exit Baptista. Now I fear thee not, sirrah young gamester. Your father were a fool to give thee all, and in his waning age set foot under thy table. Tut, a toy. An old Italian fox is not so kind, my boy. Exit. A vengeance on your crafty, withered hide. Yet I have faced it with a card of ten. Tis in my head to do my master good. I see no reason but supposed De Lucencio must get a father called supposed Vincencio. And that's a wonder. Fathers commonly do get their children. But in this case of wooing, a child shall get a sire, if I fail not of my cunning. Now, in the LibriVox version, Gremio seems to be reading one of Baptista's lines. It's the one that goes, Now I fear thee not. So, young gamester, your father were a fool to give thee all, and in his waning age set foot under thy table. Tut a toy. An old Italian fox is not so kind, my boy. Presuming that is one of Baptista's lines, we can see what a smooth operator he is. He has strung up Tranio as Lucentio like a goose. Trionio has bid things he personally does not have, and because he's gone too far, my dad has seventeen ships. Baptista has caught him and said, if you can get your dad here and offering all of that in a fortnight, you've got her. Otherwise, she goes to my dear old friend and neighbour here. Yes, she goes to my dear old friend and neighbour who, because he was bidding against you, has just promised my daughter all of his stuff to the absolute exclusion of the rest of his blood kin, and he's old, and if he dies, and she's a widow, then she comes back under my care. Either they have kids, and they get his stuff, or I do, and then Kate and her kids get his stuff. He even tells Tronio he's an idiot. He says, this is how we roll in Padua. You will take my stuff from my cold dead fingers, or words to that effect. So Baptista offers no dowry to anyone. He never even promises them the other half of his lands after he dies. He might give them to the church, or to Kate's kids, or to his mistress, or new wife, or something. He knows Tronio is a dummy bidder, and he uses him to gouge Grimio. Grimio, fortunately, doesn't care. He knows what he wants. He knows he's willing to go all in to get it. And if he can't have Bianca, then he's going to make sure that she gets as much of the other guy's stuff as he can. Bianca gets a dowry of some kind. Petruccio tells her eventual husband that she's well dowered, but that's at Baptista's whim. It's not part of a deal. Baptista also doesn't go for this and only if she loves you business that he pulled with Kate. She's trouble. He needs to sort her out, and he's a bit inclined to the view that she mightn't care which one he chooses. I have to say, I quite like Grimio. I wish he had a happy ending. This play is badly written in the sense that the minor characters just fade out when the playwright's plot wanders away from them. Eventually, Bianca does what her father worries that she might do. She just marries who she likes without asking him. She marries her tutor, who, as happy fortune would have it, is the real version of the guy that Tranio was pretending to be. This is Shakespeare. People pretend to be other people all the time. Sorry about that. It makes for difficult podcasting. His name is Lucentio. Where is Lucentio? Here's Lucentio. Right son to the right, Vincentio, that have by marriage made thy daughter mine, while counterfeit supposes bleared thine eyne which is Shakespearean for she's mine and you were distracted by a decoy. This is perfectly legal. You don't need a father's consent for marriage at this time. That being said, there are social consequences if they follow this route. Baptista is very, very rich and gets ready with the smiting. But do you hear, sir? Have you married my daughter without asking my good will? Fortunately for all concerned, Lucentio's dad, who is a nobleman, is here by now and he just says... Fear not, Baptista, we will content you. Go to. Which, because he's frighteningly rich and noble, is what he's meant to say. Compare this to Tronio's bid. Vincentio's bid is all, I know my game, I know you know your game, we have your daughter, we don't want to annoy you so much that you disinherit her, we have a lot of money and prestige, we can deal. Privately, I have some revenge to deal with first, and so do you, so let's get the revenge on Tranio together, and then we'll talk. And by the way, my son's a nobleman, so you just have to forgive all the things he's just done. That's how this works. If you want to step up, 
from the middle class into the lower upper class. We've offended you, sure, but you'll forgive us as part of the package, and I'll go a tiny bit easier on you than I usually would. And he can say all of this with, we will content you, because these guys have huge etiquette and bargain scores and they can both do the numbers. Later, Baptista gives a second dowry to Kate when she is changed in the final scene. Petruccio also gets a couple of other guys to bet him 200 crowns apiece that she'll obey him, and she does. There is one read of the text that indicates that she can see the angles of the thing and she's playing along in his game, but that's a bit forgiving and postmodern. So Petruccio comes out of this with, in ours terms, 10,080 mythic pounds. This is atypical, but it's a great starting story for a merchant house. He could grab Bianca's suitors and say, Guys, I have a big idea. And so we come to the end of our lengthy foray into Shakespearean dowries. I admit I was thinking of Austen rather than Shakespeare when I first designed that section of City and Guild. Austen is an excellent source of ideas because her books are generally about characters of the middle class seeking advancement. I hope you can see the story potential that I saw there.